So uh, the last talk of this morning session is by Anna Miriam Benini from the University of Parma. Anna is going to talk on Magnesat Sullivan theorem for finite type meromorphic maps. Thanks, Anna. So thanks for, for giving me this chance to speak. And sorry for not being there in person. I really wanted to come, but life teaching is, is what it is. And uh, so before I even start, let me say that this is joint work with Mathieu Asturg and Nuria Fagella, but exactly like Nuria mentioned in her talk, there was an improvement due to Lasser Rempet, one of the theorems in which uh, he made us realize, well, he realized himself and then told us that some geometric assumption was in fact redundant. So let me, let, I would, this will be some, there will be some overlapping with Nuria's talk. And so let me start by setting up the stage again and talk about natural families. So what are we considering? We're considering um, families of meromorphic functions or ranging over a holomorphic parameter lambda and each of these functions is meromorphic. Later we will restrict to finite type and they, they are parameterized by a complex parameter lambda belonging to a complex manifold M and they depend holomorphically on this parameter. So this is a holomorphic family of, of uh, meromorphic function and we need to restrict our families of, uh, of meromorphic functions to natural families. What are natural families? Natural families are a family, a families in which each function in the family can be written in terms of one specific function, a base point that can be chosen arbitrarily. And uh, how does it, uh, how is it written in terms of this function? We, F lambda needs to be a composition, a pre and post composition of, our of a base point, a base function F with quasi-conformal homeomorphism. And this quasi-conformal homeomorphism, in order to preserve the holomorphic dependence of F lambda on the holomorphic parameter lambda, needs to be themselves depending holomorphically on lambda. So phi and psi are quasi-conformal in Z, but they are holomorphic in the parameter lambda. And um, if we take our F, our base point F, to be a quasi-conformal map, then what you get is that every, sorry, your, our F to be a meromorphic map, then what you do get is that every F lambda is in fact merom a meromorphic. Why is that? Uh, we will see it better in the next slide, but essentially I like to think of phi and psi as being, as being homeomorphic change of coordinates, one in the target and one, um, and one, in, one in the domain and one in the range, and so the local covering properties of our function, um, our function f lambda will be basically the same covering properties as the function f. And I forgot to say that we also need to uh, assume that all the f lambda are holomorphic so that somehow the quasi-conformal uh, distortion introduced by psi lambda and then pushed forward by f is then neutralized by the quasi-conformal distortion which is uh, introduced by phi lambda. And since really, again, the local covering structure is preserved by this, um, by this type of um, composition, which is called, by the way, quasi-conformal equivalence, by assuming that f is of finite type, this will imply that all the f lambda are of finite type. What does it mean, finite type? It means finitely many singular values. So from now on, I try to put it in most statements, but we will always assume that our functions have finitely many singular values. Why is that? It comes up for two reasons. So one reason is that in several proofs, like many proofs, we really need the singular values to be isolated. And this can only be ensured by, um, by having finally many of them. And then in the final, final, final steps in the, of the proofs of the Magnesset Sullivan theorem, we need to be able to do a finite um, number of perturbations in order to make um, all our singular values to have some prescribed behaviors. So really there are two reasons why we need finite type. One is the local reason that we need to make sure all our asymptotic values are uh, logarithmic singularities. So this is ensured by the fact that they're isolated. And the other reason is that you will see, I will show you a bit of a proof in the end, 
we need to be able to do a certain perturbation argument finitely many times to prescribe the behavior of the singular values. And there are many, many examples. And in fact, here I only put one dimensional examples, but your M could be any complex dimension. We will assume that it has finite dimensional. So very simple examples are the case uh, in which um, your uh, quasi-conformal maps phi and psi are in fact conformal. So in that case, you are ensured that your F lambda is conformal because it's a composition of conformal maps. And many of the families that we are familiar with are just composition of, you apply the identity first, so you don't do anything, your psi minus one is the identity, then you apply your F, and then you compose with the Möbius map. For example, this is the case for the quadratic family or any unicritical family. Is the case for lambda tangent of Z, which is an, a, a, like the base family for meromorphic function of lambda e to the Z, which is kind of the base function for entire transcendental dynamics. And as Nuria mentioned, um, there is a theorem by Remain Conlu, which in 92, which tells that if you, in some precise way, make these families maximal, so then, uh, and you have finally many singular values, then your maximal natural family forms uh, a complex dimension of, or a non complex manifold of dimension Q plus two. What does maximal mean? It means you see from this pink equation, F lambda equals phi lambda composed with F composed with psi lambda minus one. Um, it, in order for it to be maximal, we need to be able to make phi and psi range over all possible quasi-conformal maps, such that the resulting F lambda is holomorphic. So why natural families? So you can really see as any family, given a natural family, you can really see that any function of lambda in your natural family is obtained by F by doing what? Um, I first apply some as a, a quasi-conformal homeomorphic change of coordinates, then I apply F, then I apply another quasi-conformal change of coordinates. Now, what is necessary in order for F lambda to be again a meromorphic function in the usual sense, we need, we need um, our psi lambda to map infinity to infinity. So infinity was essential singularity in the domain for F, and we only want F lambda to have an essential singularity at infinity again. So if psi lambda was displacing infinity, the new singularity for F lambda would be in the displaced point where we want to keep it at infinity. So we will, um, consider, only, um, we will consider only psi lambda to fix infinity. On the other hand, in a certain sense, so infinity has a double role here. In the domain, it is the place where the function is not defined. It is the lieu of the essential singularity. In the target space, when you look at meromorphic functions rather than transcendental, infinity is a point like any other. So in the range, we can allow pi to move infinity around. And, uh, and this is why we are not asking phi to fix infinity. Uh, so again, uh, because of this concept that um, phi and psi are just local change of coordinates different in the domain and in the range, it preserves the local properties in the following sense. You can see here that I just wrote that the singular value for F lambda, so I'm, okay, S of F lambda is a set of singular values for F lambda and phi lambda and uh, S of F is a set of singular values for F. And um, when I write that the set of singular values for F lambda is really the set of singular values of F pushed uh, forward by phi lambda, what am I doing? You can see it in two, in two ways. One, you can see the fact that if you have a neighbor, I'm sorry, I cannot write, but if you have a neighborhood um, near which has a critical point, so if you have a, take a neighborhood here and F has a critical point, then what happens? This neighborhood is mapped D to one to some other neighborhood in the target space. You push it forward by quasi-conformal change of coordinates, you will get again a neighborhood, and this has to be mapped again D to one to the image of this other neighborhood under phi. So really, critical points map to critical points. There is no freedom. In this sense, when you look at natural families of Russian maps of degree D, they are bigger spaces than natural families as we are defining them now. Because when you have 
of rational maps of a certain degree, you allow critical points to move freely and merge. While here, we are not allowing critical points to merge, okay? The covering properties are preserved locally. And so, in fact, every singular value for F is mapped under phi, ah, this is a bar phi, slight typo, is mapped under phi to a critical value for F lambda, and it keeps the same nature. And why phi? Because critical points are in the domain and singular values are in the range. Critical values or asymptotic values or any type of singular value play their role when we see them in the range. And so again, critical points are preserved and move holomorphically because our maps of psi and phi depend holomorphically on lambda. And finally, let me mention that there are, again, two points in considering natural families of meromorphic function. One point is this relation. This relation is really magical. I'm not going to be able to show the role here, but it's very useful in many proofs. It gives you a way to tackle the concept of what happens with your functions moving holomorphically. And another very important notion is the fact that this quasi-conformality on phi and psi allows you to do distortion estimates, which are compact in the incompass subset of M, okay? And this is crucial to many proofs in many theorems. So this is kind of a topological notion if you want, if you forget for a second that they are quasi-conformal, and this is useful to understand the behavior of F lambda in terms of the behaviors of F, like all this notion of critical points and singular values moving holomorphically would be preserved even if phi and psi were not quasi-conformal, they were just homomorphism. This idea of a local change of coordinate, but then quasi-conformality is really what you use to make the topological notion precise and make the estimates work. Okay, so what is our goal? Our goal is to look at one of the many versions of magnesite sullivan And magnesite sullivan theorem, in fact, as I understand, was proved independently by Lubitsch and by magnesite sullivan in the 80s. And then there is a generalization by Remenko and Lubitsch in 92. And what does it say? It says that if you have a natural family of rational or entire maps, natural family is really important for the entire version, but it's not crucial for the rational version. For the rational version, you can work with holomorphic families of rational maps to the same degree. So when you have a natural family of rational or entire maps, and if they're entire, you need to assume finitely many singular values, then the following facts are equivalent. The Julia sets move holomorphically. I'm not going to define holomorphic motions, but essentially any point in, uh, in the Julia set can be followed as a holomorphic function of the parameter in an injective way. And all singular values are passive in a neighborhood of your parameter. I know I haven't defined passive again. I'll come back to it in a second. But, um, and then you have many more equivalent notions. McMullen states seven of them in his book about renormalization. And one of them is that the number of attracting cycles is constant in a neighborhood of lambda zero. Said intuitively, the idea is that you want the Julius had moved solomorphically, even only if there are no bifurcations, whatever the word bifurcation is allowed to. Move. And the corollary, I'm gonna show the proof of the corollary because again, we will need several adjustments to the actual proofs that you work for rational functions and for entire functions. The corollary, is that Julia says move holomorphically on an open dense set, which was which is kind of one of the statements that people have in mind when they talk about minus Sullivan for rational maps. So let us be more precise on what Nuria said this morning, and let us try to understand what does it mean for Julia says to move holomorphically. This holds for holomorphic families, not necessarily for natural families. So. We know that Julia sets are the closure of repelling periodic points. And we also know the lambda lemma, which if you don't know, means that holomorphic motion extends to the closure. Putting these two, two, these two things together, this tells you that to have the Julia set, which is the closure of repelling periodic points, which moves holomorphically, really means looking at what happens to repelling periodic points, which, which move holomorphically, okay? And there is really a big improvement because we have no information of the single point, what the single points do in the Julia set, but we have a reasonably good understanding of what means for periodic points to move holomorphically. 
So putting together these two things, the question of when does the Julia set move holomorphically really becomes the question of when do repelling periodic points move holomorphically. And uh, we can understand this question looking in detail at the picture that Nuria was showing to you. So I can take my set. What are periodic points? Periodic points, if I take fix on function, periodic points are points which come back to themselves after a certain number of iterates. But if I move my function a little bit, if I, I can look at these periodic points as points which move together with my function in my parameter space. So as in a certain way, a more correct, a more precise way to looking at periodic points, to be more precise at points fixed by a certain iterate of f, because I talk about periodic points of period n without implying that the period is minimal. So a more precise way of looking at periodic points is looking at couples in uh, the product space between the complex manifold and the complex plane, looking at couples in which you specify your point, which is periodic, and you also specify the function for which it's periodic, okay? So these are, the, I will say that I will define PQ, which are the sets of points fixed by F to the Q, but in a precise way, seeing it in the product space of the manifold M, which contains my parameters and the complex plane C, there will be couples identified by a parameter, which tells me which function I should look at, and the point, which is the point that will be periodic under the function F lambda. So precisely this is the couple lambda Z in N times C, for which F lambda to the Q of Z is equal to Z, okay? Notice that PQ for any Q contains all fixed points, for example. So again, let me stress, the period is non-minimal. Why do I want the period to be non-minimal? Because I want to allow cycles of different periods colliding together to create parabolic points, okay? I don't want to restrict to just one specific period. Now, let us look at how these sets PQ look like when I look at them in the product space. So you can see that they are varieties. They are, if you want, they are zeros of the holomorphic function F varieties algebraic, sorry. They are, um, I don't remember the name right now, but they're like null sets for entire functions in, uh, in several complex variables. So they are smooth except at uh, algebraic singularities and uh, they can tend to infinity in the following sense. You could have that your parameter converges to a finite parameter, a parameter belonging to the manifold. This is important. It's not a parameter in the boundary of the manifold. It's a parameter in the manifold. And it can happen that as you converge to this parameter, your points, one of your points, this con contains all the points in all the cycles, okay? So there are infinitely many branches. There is one branch for every point in every cycle of period dividing Q. So what can happen is that one point or many points in my cycle start moving towards a boundary of C, but my parameter is moving towards a parameter in M. And if you look now at the projection from this graph, it's not a graph, sorry, from this set PQ to your manifold M, you can look at the algebraic singularities of these uh, null sets as um, critical points for the map and the image the image pi one of this, uh, let's say, um, algebraic singularities are critical values for your, um, for your projection map. And what happens to these values in M at which one or more points in the cycle goes to infinity? They can really be seen as defini by definition as asymptotic values for this projection. So you can make this precise and you can check that the only obstruction for a certain periodic point to move holomorphically, or if you want, the only obstruction for J stability for uh, holomorphic motion of the Julia set in the notation we were using before, is when you have critical values for this projection map, and you can check these are exactly parabolic points, points for which para parabolic parameters, parameters for which the map has a parabolic point, and you can specify everything that you imagine it to be. And cycles going to infinity, or in other words, asymptotic values for this projection map from this 
apparently very weird the first time you see it, but then very natural. It is really the right way to see it. So what did we do? We went, we transformed the question of when does a Julia set move holomorphically into the question of when do periodic points move holomorphically? And that we transform into the question at looking at critical and asymptotic values for this projection. Let us investigate a bit more, let us understand without giving proofs, what is this relation between critical values of this projection map and parabolic points. And you can prove a proposition which tells you that you are a critical parameter. So a critical parameter means uh, um, critical value for the projection map. If and only if you have a parabolic point and the parabolic uh, has period dividing, uh, dividing your Q that you chose, and the multiplier is exactly equal to one. This is very well known to many of you, but let me give you the details because it's so well known and so well understood that it's usually not to be found. And the proof is very elementary and uses the implicit function theorem. So what is our P, Pn or Q or whatever you want to call it? This is the set of zero of a holomorphic function of two parameters, lambda of two variables, lambda and z, and uh, this is the set in which the function f lambda of the n of z minus z is equal to zero. And what does the implicit function tell you? In, in inverting pi one, so pi one goes from pn to m. So inverting pi one means fixing a parameter and being able to write z as z of lambda. Let me go back. It really means you fix a parameter. I'm taking this one, which is a regular parameter. And I am able to find the neighborhood in which all these fibers over this neighborhood are actually graphs, graphs in the variable lambda giving the variable z. Okay, so inverting pi one really means writing z as z of lambda. And the implicit function theorem tells you that you can do if and only if your big function, your functions which defines the zero set, is, um, is, uh, can, it has a differentiable with respect to that, the variable that you want to write as expression of lambda, so is, an, is invertible. So it, the differentiable is non-singular at a specific point. And what is the differential of this function of big F is just the derivative of F to the N computed in a certain point at a certain parameter minus one, because this is just the identity it does not depend on lambda. Okay, so you can do it if and only if this is different from zero. So you can do it at any point for which this equation is not satisfied, which means you can do it at any parameter for which you have no parabolic cycles of multiplier one. And uh, notice that this bifurcation, this impossibility to invert suddenly happens. If this is true for one point in the cycle, this is true for every point in the cycle. So this bifurcation, allow me the term, really happens at every point in the cycle simultaneously. And looking back, you can kind of understand what people mean when cycles collide. It's really, this is really like a critical point. So it's really, you imagine cycles getting together of periods dividing Q, merging together in one cycle and then separating again. Okay, so another interesting thing is the following. This is used several times. It's another concept which is not always very clearly explained. So let me tell you, and forgive me if you're an expert. So take a parabolic point for some function, z naught parabolic point for f lambda naught, and assume it as multiplier one, which is where this bifurcation occurs. Note, okay, if the multiplier is not one, you can still have parabolic cycles with multipliers which are not one but somehow they are coming from collisions with cycles of higher period. This is why when you look at PQ, you get the multiplier one and you don't have get other types of rational multiplier. This theory of parabolic bifurcations in detail is really intricate, okay? Anyway, what happens if you have a parabolic one? Look at this multiplier equation. Then we have two possibilities. This, if you let, if you let lambda vary, you don't fix lambda not anymore. Um, this, is really an, this is really an equation, fq lambda prime of z is equal to one. And either this is equal to one constantly in some lambda neighborhood, 
in which say which is a persistent parabolic cycle, or this the multiplier map is open, where open is not correct in the sense that this is a map from, you can see this is a map of lambda, and this is a map so from a manifold of a certain dimension to C. The multiplier, the derivative of this cycle is in C. So what is happening, it is open in the following sense. If it's not constantly equal to one, your differential has rank at least one. So you can find one direction that you can identify to, uh, by your differential in which you locally have a curve uh, on which your function from this curve to C is open, which means in parameter space, you can always find locally a curve in which for a nearby parameter, your cycle becomes attracting or repelling or Siegel or Kramer. Okay, being open means that the range of your multiplier map will take neighborhood of one. And in particular, it will catch both points. Well, it will catch points with multiplier of modulus one, which can be linearizable or not. It will catch attracting points and it will catch repelling points. Of course, this needs to be made precise. So the tricky part and the new part, so far so good, you know, this is all about rational maps. It's just, I'm telling it because maybe not everybody's familiar. But now let us go to the true new point. The true new point is when you have asymptotic values of pi one, this should be asymptotic values, not similar values. Let us ask what happens with asymptotic values and cycles exiting the domain. So you remember a couple of slides ago, we have this picture and we have an asymptotic parameter, which means an asymptotic value for the projection function if in your manifold, you go to a finite parameter, a parameter in the manifold, but in the complex plane, you go to infinity. Now, this cannot happen for rational maps for multiple reasons. One reason is exactly what Nuria said. Rational maps are defined from the Riemann sphere to itself, so infinity is a point like any other. But another way to see it is to see that when you try to solve this equation, uh, when you try to solve the equation for a periodic point for rational maps, depending on certain parameters, in order for your periodic point, your fixed point to go to infinity, you need the coefficients to go to infinity. So another way of seeing it, in my view, I hope it is correct, is to see to say that if you have cycles which go to infinity for rational maps, you need your, um, no, I said something wrong, sorry. Okay, um, forget about it. Uh, we say that the cycle exits a domain uh, if one of its points, one of the points in the cycle goes to infinity as the parameter converges to lambda naught. And this is exactly what was shown in this picture. So you go to infinity in the complex plane, but you move to a finite parameter. And um, this cannot happen for rational maps, or better, if it happens, uh, infinity can be part of a cycle. Sorry if I said something imprecise before. Infinity can be part of a cycle, but really nothing is happening there because infinity is a point like any other. And for entire functions, Periodic points can tend to infinity only if the periodic points in a cycle can go to infinity only if the entire cycle moves to infinity. Why? Because in order for a point to move to infinity, you also need its pre-image to move to infinity because there is no way, there are no poles. So there is no way for a finite part of the plane to be mapped towards infinity. So for entire function, the first kind of clear observation is that if cycles go to infinity, they go all together. And let me tell you a little spoiler that if we have natural families of entire function, in fact, they can exit the domain at all. And for meromorphic functions, they can, but they need to involve active singular values. Where active will mean that they will need to be mapped to infinity after a certain number of steps. And I will need to be more precise about this later, but what is happening is that for entire function, the only asymptotic value that can be, the only singular value that can be involved with cycles moving to infinity, if they have finitely many singular values, they all stay in a compact set. So the only way that asymptotic or critical value or any type of value can be involved with cycles moving towards infinity, the only singular value which is there is infinity. But infinity is always an omitted value for entire function. So it is always an asymptotic value for functions finding too many similar values. And uh, hence, it is persistently an asymptotic value, so it cannot be active. Of 
course, you will now complain that I haven't defined active and passive yet. So what is an active singular value? We take our natural family, we take a singular value. We have seen that by the very way we define these families, now it's crucial that it's a, that it's a composition of F with one, with two quasi-conformal maps on either side. The, the singular values move holomorphically in lambda. We, and we have a, an explicit way of writing it. The singular values for F lambda are phi lambda of the singular values of F. Pick one, call it V lambda. So you choose one singular value of V. This is well-defined. Phi lambda is a conformal homeomorphism, and it depends holomorphically on lambda. So the V lambdas are well-defined for all lambda. And we call it active if one of these two things happen. Either at some point the iterate stops, like Nuria said, so at some point your point F lambda N of V lambda is mapped to infinity, which is the same as saying that the iterates afterwards cannot be well-defined anymore. This is the iterates of the singular value V lambda under the map F lambda, okay? Um, so either you stop being able to iterate your singular value under your function, or your family of iterates in a neighborhood of lambda is not normal, okay? So here we need the, con the, we need to con con the concept of uh, um, being not normal in a parameter neighborhood of your, of your um, parameter lambda naught. And let me explain a bit more about this. Now, it's important that this condition is non-persistent. Uh, what does it mean that they iterate F lambda to the, to, to the N V lambda is not well-defined for all N? It means that at some point for some K, F lambda zero to the K of V lambda zero, your parameter at which the function, the, at which the family of iterate is not well-defined is equal to infinity. And why do we ask it to be non-persistently? Because in a certain sense, if it's persistently not well-defined, we, the, it is equal to infinity for all of your parameters in a neighborhood, hence it's equal to infinity everywhere by the um, identity principle. So really nothing is going on in this parameter, which is special and different from other parameters. So when this happens, when the iterate of some singular value hit infinity at a finite step in a non-persistent way, we say that our parameter lambda naught is a singular parameter. And we can distinguish on, between the nature of the, singular, of the singular value, which is involved in this singular relation, I would call it, uh, by distinguishing between critical parameters if a critical value is mapped to infinity and asymptotic parameters if an asymptotic value is mapped to infinity. And let us look at some examples, okay? So entire functions with finitely many singular value, infinity is in a certain sense, the only preimage of itself. So in a certain sense, if you consider infinity to be a singular value, it is um, persistently mapped to infinity as an essential singularity, okay? Not again, that infinity has many roles here. It can play the role of a value in, in that sense, it can play the role of an asymptotic value or a critical value or a singular value. And this depends on who are the images of infinity in a way, which are poles and the asymptotic tracks that we have seen, which basically means infinity itself is Oriana, a point. Yes? Uh, just, just a quick clarification. Um, sorry. So, sorry, you may have said this, but in, in your definition, in the first part, you say it's non persistently not well-defined at lambda naught. But I think what you mean is that there's no neighborhood on which all of those iterates are defined. Sorry, yes. So they might yes, yes, all yes. be defined at lambda yes. naught, but there might be might be nearby points. Accumulating. Where it's not, yeah. Of course. Sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, yes, it should have been in a neighborhood of lambda naught. Okay. Thank you. It may be that. Uh, so it's a. Uh, Yes, and the, the degrees could go to infinity. So I think you're right in what should say it's not well defined in a neighborhood of lambda. Thank you. So let me expand a little bit more uh, on examples. I think I'm still doing reasonably well with time. I need to finish like at 120 more, no, 110. Okay. Um, so I think this is important. 
So if and oh, and of course the parameter is um, is called passive if it's not active. So if we have that a singular value converges to an attracting fixed point, a specific singular value for some parameter lambda naught, then the attracting point is persistent in the lambda neighborhood of lambda naught and keeps attracting d lambda. So the function f and lambda of v lambda converges to the the periodic point has moving holomorphically as a function of lambda in that parameter neighborhood, okay? So its singular values, which converge to tracking cycles, are passive. On the other hand, parabolic points, again, parabolic parameters are important for us. If uh, you converge to a parabolic fixed point, then in a lambda neighborhood, you can find this slice that I was talking about before. And so nearby, you can have repelling points. So and you cannot converge to a repelling point. So this means that you cannot find any function to which you your iterates converge to. So your family cannot be normal. So these parabolic points are really an example in which a family of iterates is not normal. And this singular parameter are an example in which the family of iterates are not well-defined. And for, for natural families of entire functions of finite type, there cannot be cycles exiting the domain. And, essential, and uh, let me talk about how we improve it. So for meromorphic families of, uh, um, for meromorphic fa natural families of meromorphic maps, we find many singular values. Um, if a cycle exits the domain, which can happen, then there needs to be a singular value involved in the cycle, such that um, F, F, uh, some iterate of this uh, singular value is equal to infinity, not persistently. So this only happens in that parameter value and not in a neighborhood. And in particular, it means that your active singular value is active. Now, let me spend one minute about this because I think this is interesting. I think this is like the core argument that was missing to prove uh, Magnus et Taliban for meromorphic maps. And uh, it's, uh, it's technically, I think the idea is very, um, the, the idea is, is non-trivial and it really goes back to Eremenko and Ljubic and then needs to, to be adapted is not the right word because you really need to introduce several more ingredients. But once you understand the idea, you're able to find the correct idea for meromorphic maps. And it relies on technical lemmas about quasi-conformal maps, which are non-trivial and which you can find in Eremenko Lubitsch 91. And again, this can be adapted, but there is one lemma, uh, which, is, which is kind of very technical, which uses uh, um, extreme length to prove, to prove how fast a function needs to grow in tracts, on curves in tracts. Anyway, so about our theorem. So what, uh, uh, to show that if you have uh, uh, a cycle which exits the domain, some asymptotic values need to be involved, is not extremely difficult. What is really difficult to make sure that this relation is non-persistent. And here is a tricky point again, because uh, you can show that the singular values involved in the cycle in some way, like Nuria said, these asymptotic values which allow you to go back from infinity to the finite point of the plane and then wander around, hit the pole, go back to infinity and wander around again. So this creation of the virtual cycle to see that it involves an asymptotic, an asymptotic value is not too difficult. But what is really difficult is to show that this asymptotic value needs to be active. And in fact, we are not yet able to show that that specific one needs to be active. For now, it may still be that there is a critical value which sneaks in and takes care of the activity. Okay, so this is something we want to work a little bit more in the future. Okay, let me mention a couple of density theorems. And, uh, um, and let me mention a couple of accessibility theorems that also Nuria mentioned. So if we take a natural family, we can define the activity locus as a set of parameters for which there is one acting singular value. Nothing known for now. And notice that I have not called it a bifurcation locus yet. And we have two theorems that we can prove. The first of all is that we have at least one non-omitted pole, then singular parameters are dense in the activity locus. Why do we need the non-omitted pole? Because poles which are not omitted are the only possible source of virtual cycles. No non-omitted pole, no virtual cycles, okay? 
And once you are able to create these virtual cycles that Nuria was talking about and that I did not mention, then uh, the, so these, po these nanometer poles really allow your cycles to go to infinity to create virtual cycles. And then you can prove the singular parameters are that. And then the natural, well, okay. And then you can prove, and this is kind of standard by taking into account that the definition of activity now has two flavors. So one, the iterate stops well defined, being well defined, and one that the, the family is not normal. Then you can also see that Mizurevich parameters, where Mizurevich is a cool name, but what I really mean is that there is one singular values which lends to a repelling cycle. They are also dense in this activity locus. Let me mention very quickly some, I call it approximation theorems because we need it in the Magnuset Sullivan, which is going to be one of the next few slides. And you can see, so this accessibility of asymptotic parameters uh, tells you that if you have an asymptotic parameter, so a parameter for which you have an asymptotic value which maps to infinity after a certain number of iterates, then you can find a curving parameter space belonging to a hyperbolic component or no, not, depends on how you define hyperbolic components. And in general, it's not a hyperbolic component, but you can find a curve of parameters in your, in your space which converges to your asymptotic parameters, parameter, and on that curve, each parameter is a cycle whose multiplier goes to zero. So they're really like the centers at infinity for the exponential, right? The virtual centers as you would like them to define following ideas by Linda Keen and Nuria Fajeya and the previous papers. And the second, and here is where we use the observation by Lasset that our condition on the geometry of tracks was really not uh, not um, necessary, and we're really thankful for pointing out not only the estimate, but also the proof of the estimate. So um, the second uh, kind of approximation theorem that I would like to point out is that in an asymptotic value which maps to infinity, it's a critical value which maps to infinity, then you can also find a sequence of centers of an appropriate period which approximate it. And we really use uh, some kind of principle which is, needs to be stated properly, but the statement is not completely trivial, which tells you that if some point an iterate of a singular value hits infinity, and we use the fact that they are isolated, the singular value, then nearby we can find parameters for which that singular value does whatever we want. Advertisement, go check the paper for this lemma because it may be useful. Okay, so what is the complete version of Magnuset Sullivan, now that we can understand all the words involved in the wishful thinking slides, a few in the very beginning. So, if we take a natural family of rational, entire, or meromorphic map, where the meromorphic is our contribution, and rational, entire are as before, and we take a, dom a domain U in, uh, in our parameter manifold, then it is equivalent to have Julia sets which move holomorphically and the fact that there are no active singular values. And then you can see that the number of starting cycle is constant, you have many more. But what I would like to focus on is really the equivalence between A and B. The equivalence between holomorphic motion of the Julia set, which tells you where you basically have structural stability, where your, your, the behavior of your function does not vary much in that neighborhood, is equivalent to activity of the singular values. And this is really where definition of a bifurcation of locus comes in, which is both the set where you have bifurcation of the parameter, where bifurcation of the singular values, so singular values which become active, and the complement of the set of stability, okay? So this equivalence really gives you the equivalence between the two different characterization of the bifurcation locus in terms of you are in the bifurcation locus if at least one of your singular values is active, and you are in the bifurcation locus if you are not in the stability locus where everything moves holomorphically. And as a corollary, using the density theorem, so, uh, sorry, using the approximation theorem, so using the fact that you have centers, virtual or real, approximating your singular parameters, you can also prove that the Julia set moves holomorphically in an open dance set. So here again, contribution by Lasse, remove the hypothesis. Let me focus on one of the implications. So the, what I think is the most interesting implication is that Julia says move holomorphically if and only if there are no active singular values around. And um, 
singular value. So the implication that holomorphic motion implies passivity, no activity, is classical. And how does it work? Singular values move, if the Julia set moves holomorphically, singular values are either in the Julia set, then they move holomorphically and preserve their nature. So you need to check something here for asymptotic values because they don't appear in the classical manifest Sullivan, but you check it's a topological fact. So it's to, the fact of being a, uh, an asymptotic value is in a certain sense a topological fact on some of the branches of the inverses. So you check that, you do your computation, and then you see that they preserve their nature. You have finitely many, they form a countable set, the Julia set is perfect, you can find three points in the Julia set which are never taken by your, the iterates of your singular values because you have finitely many of them. And of course, these points will vary with lambda. And so you need to use an improved version of Mantel's theorem, which tells you that you can omit three holomorphic functions instead of omitting three, um, three fixed values. And by Montel, you get by magic the normality of all the iterates of the singular values under their own under their own function in a neighborhood. This other implication, so the fact that no singular value is active, passivity of singular values implies holomorphic motion, is really the new piece. And it works kind of like this, quickly said. Suppose it does not move holomorphically. Then we use this kind of proposition that we quoted before, that either you have parabolic parameters or singular parameters, the one for which an iterate of a singular value hits infinity. For parabolic, it's more or less like in the rational case. So they are active because this multiplier function is not constantly equal to one, so it's open. So you find this curve and you can locally perturb and they are not active, you know? This is just what we said a few slides ago. And for singular values, this is what you need to use. This theorem, which is, again, I think it's the, our most technical piece that um, cycles go, uh, exiting the domain implies activity of some singular value that we don't know yet whether it's critical or asymptotic. And yes, one can prove the density of um, the density of J stability. We can prove that the bifurcation locus has empty interior essentially by using approximation by uh, singular values if we have them, or if not proceeding like Magnus and Sullivan and using all this approximation theorem. But I really think this is the time to stop and sorry so much for not being there. Atana, are there any questions or comments? I have some questions. Well, I've asked a lot of questions already. So I don't know whether any other questions. I'll, I'll pause for a moment. No, I think you can ask so, us. Uh, I have, I have um, um, a remark. Yes, you were also quoted, but we didn't understand that yet. We need to work on this. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, anyway, anyway <laughs> I have a remark. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know what. Um, uh, about the definition of Anna's definition of um, active uh, um, single value in, in for rational functions, of course. Yes, that's that's the definition I um, I used in um, 1981 note uh, for one parameter polynomial families. Precise definition and uh, uh, well, I call it uh, irregular parameter. And um, so it, it, well, it appeared in a, in a Russian journal and which translates uh, to English. Um, and it's indeed very convenient to use because you can apply a Mantel theorem and prove density of Mysterievich parameters. And also um, that uh, this. Uh, uh, a regular set of parameters is, is a limit set for super attractant parameters. And in fact, that was my motivation because I wanted to understand the set of parameters like uh, Feigenbaum ones after infinitely many bifurcations, limit parameters for infinitely many bifurcations. And it turned out that this normality definition fits very well for this. Uh, yeah, Misha Lubitsch, uh, uh, we were at the same country at that time, which called Soviet Union. Uh, so uh, he uh, knew about my work and uh, acknowledged this, of course, 
and, and developed it uh, further uh, and use it to prove density of J, J, J stability for, for, uh, for rational maps. Uh, okay. I, I have something else, but let me stop here. Okay, maybe we can talk later in some way that I don't know how tactically, but uh, um, I would like to know more actually. Uh, maybe maybe no, we can no, talk by email. No problem. I mean, by Zoom. Uh... Yes, I will. I will write you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gennady. All right. Thank you. So, so well, I've got, I've got a few questions, but let me ask a, ask a quick one first. So you have this result about approximation by uh, centers if you have a critical parameter. Yes. And there's an n plus two and n plus three. Now, yeah. now na naively in kind of a general situation, you might expect, you might, you might naively hope for n plus one, I guess, because you might be going after n steps to, uh, um, to infinity, and then you might hope to be mapping back to where, where you started out with. Um, so so um, is, I, I just wonder where does the n plus two or n plus three come from? Does, is it is it from kind of exceptional cases or is there, is there a deeper reason for it? Um, so the n plus three is an exceptional case, in, um, but I don't remember um, the n plus two. I think you needed one iterate. This was a bit of a well. I, I, I need I would need to think about it, and I didn't check well. But um, you, I think. Uh, you needed the, uh, from infinity one step more to go back. Maybe Nuria remembers. Uh, you want to go once back to the critical, so critic, yes. crit, n, n is yeah. the number of critical values, but yeah. then you want to go back to the critical point. Exactly. Yeah, then, exactly. Because, which might, you might only have a finite, it might, you know, it might be just one critical point over the critical value. And um, you exactly. need one, one more step than you expect, yes. Okay. Exactly, because you need to go back to the critical point, right, sorry. And, and then in the case that the critical point, uh, well, in the case that there is some issue with the critical point, I don't remember which one, like, oh, I could check, but I don't have it under, and it would take too long to check. So I, the, I will write you to The end of oh, three comes yeah. because uh, at some very exceptional cases where one of your iterates is singular, you need to use the five island theorem instead, yeah. of, uh, instead of the usual shooting lemma, which means that uh, you need one step more. So I, that's I was a wondering... Very very uh, exceptional okay. case, but yeah. n plus two is the minimum that you need to get a side yeah, yeah, yeah. center. Yeah, I, 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 I see now. Yes, yes. So I was thinking if you have infinite, maybe if you have infinite many critical points, um, but uh, if you have only over that critical value. Um, so, so I was thinking about um, finite type maps in the sense of Adam Epstein. Um, ah, and, yes. And kind of, uh, you know, what, what would be the, because that seems to be the natural setting. In a way to look at this. So, so one thing, um, maybe that's more of a remark, but one thing I realized uh, as you were talking is that um, if we're going to look at the full parameter space, um, then actually I think the result becomes quite simple and actually simpler than in the entire case. Because if we do the full parameter space, then we are allowed to move in the asymptotic value at infinity off. And if we do so, then you know, all of these issues of you know, there, there are no persistent relations. Uh, in that space. So I think if you have no persistent asymptotic values, including infinity, um, then the argument um, becomes uh, becomes quite uh, quite straightforward for, for the density of structural stability. So it's somehow about understanding what happens in these families, which may be defined by um, by a critical relations, which is why why there's more work to be done, both already already in Eremenko and Ubich and now extended extended by you. I don't know whether that's how you see it. Um, but what I really wanted to ask is what, what are the what are the I mean, have you thought about the case of general finite type maps? Um, one might expect there to be uh, kind of similar results, except now, of course, you may have asymptotic curves that accumulate on a whole part of the boundary somewhere. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily get curves leading to your parameter where the where the um, orbit disappears. Um, but one might hope that that still uh, you know appropriate versions of the result are true. So we think that it's going to work on finite type maps, but you need to make sure that we understand the, how, what happens. Uh, well, we want to make sure that, that it's okay. If we, we wanted to make sure that it works for meromorphic first, and then we are basically writing up the finite type case, but we are still like checking some details. And okay. uh, yeah. And Mathieu Storg understands this well, and, and we are discussing to, to make it work. And yes, it's um, in some sense the natural setting, and there, of course, cycles going 
going to exiting the domain. So finite type maps are maps which instead of having one essential singularity, you have a domain on which boundary there are the singularities that, that you want. And then when exiting the domain, you need to, to be a bit more careful, I think, on what that means. And then also with singular values, I don't know. Well, we, we are looking at it and we, we need, we, it will take some time last, I think. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions or comments? Well, if not, let's thank Anna again.